Okay, so today is November 20th, 2021, and this is our Eastern Extinction Audi meeting. And uh, I'll leave it to Hugh or Gary. I know Gary had some questions on the post, so uh, whoever wants to start it off, uh, go for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Do you want to, start, Gary? Yeah. Look, uh, there was two main things, uh, <clears throat> and um, I'm hoping that we can deal with both of them to some extent. I mean, obviously, Hugh is is uh, got some bee in his bonnet now. We we're onto the big flip, uh, and there's a couple of things uh, I'd like to say about that. Um, but just before we do that, can I just ask you, uh, that, that I, I feel as though sometimes we've gone a bit astray with the meetings, that we've, we've left behind the spiritual dimension and we've kind of left behind the meeting as a kind of hospice zone. And, uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I'm interested, uh, Perhaps not now, because I, I, I want to go on to something, another just shorter point. But um, I, I guess my concern about the suggestion with the flippening is that it's uh, it could be a very interesting exercise for a variety of reasons. But I wonder if that's still leading us away from the, this sort of core concern of, of the spiritual dimension and the the the, the desiderata being a kind of a hospice for the end times. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it is going to sort of lead us away or lead us back. What's your? I'm I'm hoping it leads us back. So yeah, the main obstacle to spiritual development is people don't think they're going to die. They're not in in touch with the death. And they think they have infinite time and, you know, they distract it. Everybody's just kind of dithering around doing their busy with some useless shit that they think is important, but couldn't be, <laughs> couldn't be less important. And they only do that because they think that, you know, they're going to live forever in effect. And uh, they have this kind of discordance because in the middle of having this conceit that they semi immortal and death is like, you know, a million years away they also run around with this death anxiety all the time. So they have uh, like, you know, Ernest Becker style death terror that motivates everything they do at the same time as if it ever, you know, death ever comes into the forebrain or the alien cortex considers it, then it dismisses it instantly. So you have this um, kind of weird duality where they running around like yeah. they're just scared to death. Um, like like scared sheep, and whenever you talk to the sheep about death, it's like, oh, death, no, you know, oh yeah, maybe one day, oh, I'm possibly immortal, and you start getting transhumanist. So you, they're never really grounded. You can never get them to face their death, and if they, you know, enlightenment is all about facing your death. It's it's you know any any enlightenment experience is a near death experience, or a complete death experience, depending on which side of the fence you are. But yeah, you know, I mean, like Dostoevsky and stuff had a, a mock execution, and Sri Ramakrishna, in within a hair's breadth of uh, committing suicide by chopping his own head off by Kali, um, and everybody gets to that point and uh, goes through a transformation. So you can't get to that point if people won't take their own death seriously, and so that it's you know. They don't even take. You see, the problem with collapse, as as presented by civilization collapse, as say Rupert Reed would and Jim Bendel and stuff, it's uh, it's very partial. It just means the death of my Western liberal lifestyle, which is not what we're talking about at all. It's much more serious than that. Um, so yeah, I think the the flipping was is what it's really all about, metaphorically and literally. Um, yeah, so, here, do you mind if I, uh, yeah, what I want to do, I, I'd love, I'd, I want you to expand on all this if you can. 
Uh, but I just wanted to get two two observations or two more sort of, if you like, superficial aspects of this out of the way, and and we can just return back to where you are now and, and keep going with that. But just just to get these two things out of the way because. There might be something in them. I, I don't know. I'll just put it to you and see. see. Um, the first thing is one of the things that I thought about when you first suggested this was uh, uh, David Icke because I've had uh, um, uh, full disclosure is that I've, I've had very little exposure to this fellow. I think I listened to one video of his uh, and read or listened to one interview with him, which was actually the most interesting thing, because when I listened to him, the first thing I thought was that his uh, discussion about these reptilian people, you know, popping out of from under the ground or somewhere wherever they're coming from, I thought, oh, look, he just he's just uh, got a metaphor for the... Um, you know the reptilian brain. It, it, it's all because if you if you That's read, him, that, I thought he was just yes. Talking yeah, yeah. Well, but the thing is, in this interview that I I I, I was a fair while ago, so I can't I haven't got a reference for it. Unfortunately, there was a very it was a very it, it wasn't a um, it was a serious interview. You know, it wasn't being flippant, and the uh, the questioner said put that to him bluntly. He said, David, but don't you really mean this reptilian people in a metaphorical sense. And he absolutely, he said, no, I literally mean literal reptilian people. Now, uh, you you could come back. I, I then thought about it. I, I kept that in my brain for a long time. But it was woken up again when you first started talking about resurrecting the flippening. Because... Uh, and also in combination with the fact that the um, earlier sort of efforts with, with uh, um, you know, Jeff Hull and all the others and and, uh, and also with um, Forty Towers and, and the rest of it, which none of it really got off the ground. Uh, and I was actually thinking that uh, David Icke is probably saying some very important things if you can read in between his lines and I'm wondering whether the flippening serves the the, flip, the cult of the flippening which we're about to form does the same thing that it will enable us to say some things and hang a lot further out the edge of the boat than we otherwise would because people will just assume that we're a bunch of nutters but anyone who wants to read between the lines uh, will get a different message and we'll have the advantage that because uh, we're considered beyond the pale, nobody will take us very seriously if we say overtly outrageous things, which, of course, aren't outrageous, but they are to, to you know, as you were saying a minute ago, people not being able to face up to their death and all this kind of thing, you know, where they don't, they don't really, um, they're not really going to accept a very... Uh, you know, a cup of coffee with three spoons of, of, of caffeine in it kind of thing. You know, the strong story is going to be too much for them uh, under normal circumstances. So I'm just making that point about, you know, the cult of the flippening being a way to be a bit more outspoken and get away with it. Um, and uh, th so there's that. Uh, and the second thing was just more mundane was um, just thinking about exactly what happens on the surface of the earth when there is a flippening. Uh, and I was just sitting there this afternoon trying to go through this uh, kind of discussion there. I, I don't know if you want to just say something about that, if you've got any thoughts, and then we can get back to the more serious part of the conversation. Yeah, just, just like, did so you see my little comment there under the, the – I made an additional comment under the meeting agenda regarding um, the acceleration of the Earth's surface, uh, maximum velocity of, of um, as the Earth does a half rotation during the flip. Do you want to just have a quick look at that? Oh, okay. Well, let's let's uh, let's get back to that because that's a, 
a technical detail, just uh, talking on, uh, you know, thousand foot level. Um, so, yeah, it's the the flipping is is met metaphorical, um, but it's also literal. The the you don't want to go around saying to people, yeah, the the flipping is just a metaphor for personal transformation or something, because um, a uh, it is literal, literal, literally true. If it isn't true and you make a cult out of it um, and it turns out to be complete nonsense and it never happens, it's, it's quite harmless from the point of view is that it's useful. It's a useful tool. I mean, all doomsday cults need a doomsday. Uh, so the, the Christian cult doesn't really work, and um, Christian and Judaism, Islam doesn't really work if you don't have an end times. If it's like a steady state, you know, so part of the the scientific or enlightenment cult of the Baconian cults, um, they were very insistent that the universe didn't have a beginning and an end. Einstein was very keen on it, so he, you know, his cosmological constant led uh, with Hubble's expansion to that Lemaitre, you know, was a priest and said, you know, well, that means we had a big bang. And the scientists absolutely hated the big bang because it meant it had a start, which implied it also had an end. And so they, that, that ruined their religion. They just said, we, we just got out of this idea that the world ends and there's any change. And so they, they for since Newton wanted the world to be very static, samey, dead, um, and uh, you know, they are death. The scientists are literally necromancers. They they want a dead world. They want Carly and the Leela, the, the the prima mater. They want her dead. They and so they were horrified that you know quantum uncertainty reared its head and the chaos came bubbling up and and then the universe had a beginning. And now it's it's just it just ruined science for for scientists. And they never really recovered. But the thing is, this difference between metaphor and and literal is, is to understand what David Ike is saying is if you get a little deeper into this, everybody has in their little normal enlightenment liberal world the world of the scientists, this like uh, decatastrophized, anesthetized. Um, sort of safe world of, of Michael Shermer, where everything's, you're skeptical about everything, you're a normie. It's, it's, it's ultimate conservatism. It's saying yeah, there's nothing it's... fantastic. Wait, wait a minute. There's nothing fantastic. There's, everything's neutral. There's nothing harmful. In other words, I'm never going to die is their metaphor. It's written underneath it. And then, uh, and then you can, you know, start icing the cake with a bit of transhumanism and stuff like that. But you see, the, what they're missing is the world is profoundly different from what they think. And it's more like, uh, they're more, you see, think of them as dreamers. Then these are people that think the dream is never going to end. And it's just, they are swanning along going down the stream. And so you know, if this dream is going to wake up, you have to explain to them that it is a dream. Now they don't accept that the universe is a dream, but if it is a dream, then all sorts of things that are possible that you don't think is possible in your Michael Shermer kind of skepticism, like reptiloids can come from other dimensions from out of the earth, the earth can flip. So, well, if you have an acid trip, you'll find out that there is a what's real and what seems real. So if you have an acid trip, it gets surreal, hyper real. And the hyper real stuff is all stuff that shouldn't exist according to scientism. So they say, oh, no, you just do it. There's something wrong with you. You're broken. You're hallucinating. You're schizoid. You're psychotic. And so it's illegitimate. So they illegitimize anything that's unusual. And so then they say, well, you know, come on, David. I, you can't literally mean reptiloids. And he's saying, well, if you go on an acid trip, you will see reptiloids. Now, the funny thing is those reptiloids are far more real than all the scientists like Einstein and these clever dicks who, you know, you'll meet in your daily life. Daily life is kind of kind of muted, volume turned down, not not much going on. But in a hyper real environment, which is what you'll go through if you make any spiritual progress, you will see shit that you will not be able to reconcile with Michael Shermer. Michael, you'll forever have to live with the fact 
that Michael Schirmer's life depends on him basically uh, quarantining, emasculating any kind of spiritual experience. He has to, just like they tried to with Lemaitre. But it, the, the universe will not go in their box. And so now the real kicker is that they are illusionary. The Einsteins, all of these people are people you dreamed of. So the world is, you know, is fantastic more. And I mean that in terms of um, a hallucination. Um, it, it's not explainable by science. Science is just a kind of a dream. It's, it's, it's a, a fake way of looking at the world. And it's a desperate attempt to kill it off. But so it is quite, it's quite legitimate to say that, yes, the, the world literally flips. It, it's science. But you see, just like science was horrified by the Big Bang, but then had to reconcile it and came up with all nonsense like Goose inflation and all these weird things that didn't fit with the scientific mind. The same applies with the flipping. The world literally does flip. If you go and look at the science, you'll see it, it reinforces itself stronger and stronger. So really, this is all about telling people about the flipping. That's what I've been trying to be doing. Well, I started this to, to tell people about the flipping, the literal flipping. Now, it's, it's almost impossible to tell people because of this Michael Shermer kind of decatastrophizing, normalizing bias. So it's they must to preserve their worldview say that you're a nut so yeah but given being uh, us turning into nuts it could be an advantage though so I'm just sort of yeah it, it, it is because because what for them you see to be normal is nuts they're living in upside down world so the flippening is from not the world turning upside down it's the world turning the right way up now they live in upside down world so everything is back to front so you're nuts because you say, oh, normal life is, you know, going to end. It's like, well, they know it's going to end. It's just a little bit of analysis knows that this way of life cannot come carry on. Industrial society doesn't wind up in, you know, the sing singular, you know, the rapture of the nerds and Ray Kurzweil's transhumanism and, and we all become gods and homo deus. I mean, that's fucking crazy. I mean, but in upside down world, you know, Yuval um, Harari is, he's, a, he's, he's sane. I mean, obviously the guy's fucking nuts. I mean, really, we become homo deus? I mean, what, how fucking nuts can you be? But David Icke's the nutty one. So it's, so you've got, a, you're talking to crazy people. So, you know, but you, the truth to them is so bizarre that they cannot stomach it. So it's how do you break the truth? Well, as it happens, it, you know, it's very difficult to communicate the, the truth that this the earth is going to flip soon. I mean, literally flip. There's going to be a, ge ge um, a geographic pole shift. It's not the, okay, I think we should start off by just talking about what the, what the flippening is, because I don't think everybody knows. And, you know, it needs to be laid out scientifically to the scientific mindset to of, of, you know, of what is coming. And then, you know, we'll go into the, the other aspects of, of, you know, what that means spiritually. But yeah, I thought it would be worthwhile just to do the mechanics of it. And yeah, just to so, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been so, yeah. The, so this, this stuff is really serious stuff. It's, it sounds like flat earth stuff. But it, once once I tell you about this, if you haven't heard what, what's going, what's coming um, and you haven't read my book, then uh, you, you'll see that, well, first of all, I apologize for putting you in the same predicament I am, is once you know this, you know, you, you'll be pretty certain it's correct. But you will, you in this terrible quandary that you can't tell anybody. So you know the most momentous thing in the world that's about to happen, but you can't tell anybody. As soon as you tell anybody, they they have it in their interest to dismiss you as a crank. It's their life depends on it in a lot of ways. Their lifestyle depends on it. So you know, people will be, you know. So I wrote a book to say it because I've been trying to do this cult to try and gently ease people into this, but. 
thinking, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, basically you'll sugarcoat it and say it's an alternate reality game. And then eventually lead people say, you know, it's not actually a game. This is all true. And that, that's the way I was thinking that that's the way you reveal it. But let me tell you that this this stuff is um, kind of serious stuff. You can get assonginated for, for revealing too much of the stuff. A lot of this stuff is classified. I tell you in my book how I came to hear about it. But but it is some... Um, it is very serious stuff. Uh, so we, we, we've worked that out. <laughs> I don't, I don't, somebody somebody else commented uh, the other day about you yeah. being Dean, and um, that was and, me. Uh, yeah, was that no, you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Dean. Dean, Dean is Dean is an amalgam of a couple of people, but the the way I am really <laughs> you in the book. The, yeah, the, I, the, I believe you. <laughs> Yeah, the way the way I came to this one is was that way. So, but um, just because I've had a strange career. Um, but anyway, once you once you know all this, all the pieces fall into place in a, in a rather awful way. Um, and but you know, everybody will say, "Oh, you're just doing this to sell books." It's like, "Oh, yeah, really? Like, <laughs> sold about five books?" It's like you 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 know, it's like, okay, I'll tell you. If I'm just doing this to sell books, I'll, I'll say if there's no flipping, right? By say like 2050, okay, you can have your money back. How's, how's that? You can have a money back guarantee if the world doesn't flip. But and then everybody will say, oh, well, you're just saying a doomer thing so that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to stop greenhouse gas emissions and stuff like that. And you say, yeah, really, you know, you invented this complete catastrophe and mass human extinction. Um, just so you can feel good about having an SUV, really. But anyway, you have you're immediately in the zone of people's psychology and the fact that they they everything depends on them rubbishing and debunking. So, it, a it will be hard to make headway um, because people just don't listen. But um, I I made a mistake, by the way. I, I thought you could be subtle, and and reveal it all gently. What what I've been learning is that the subtlety is gone. In the age of the internet, you can hit people over the head with a sledgehammer and they don't <laughs> hear it. It's like there's no subtlety doesn't get you anywhere. Um, I think so, um, Hugh, you made a very important point in that discussion that you had with Sophie, I think it was, about young people today. Uh, you were talking about when you were young and how an ice cream was a special thing. You know, and then, you know, the later generations, there's just nothing that you can say to them or show them. They're just not, um, nothing special anymore. Uh, and possibly that is also a bit of a parallel with what you're trying to explain here. It's people are so over bombarded with hyperbolic scenarios that they just don't make an impression anymore. You know, they all just get shoved into the same basket. Um, you know, yeah, so like 300 years of scientism has um, in, encouraged in the kids, the educational system encourages people to say, if something is, is abnormal, unusual, then it's suspect and liable to be untrue because, you know, basically the church of scientism has the truth nailed down, and so anything that's, you know, radical is um, probably. Uh, you can you can write it off at face value because you know if it was true we would have we would have told you in school and like you know it's it's you you yeah. so so yeah there's this normalcy bias that um, will make people and 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 in this age if you if you come up with uh, if you try to popularize an idea like the Earth flip uh, you know. Nobody wants to analyze something. Nobody wants to look at it. In the 1950s, some people would have said, well, there are holes in that hypothesis. Now they go, you know, oh, that's been debunked. All you have to do is call it debunked. And then you, you, you know, you put something out there in some op-ed, um, make a very thin analysis, basically saying, you know, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of the, the mainstream religion. I have good mainstream religion credentials and few, you know, rationalisms that mean it's not true. And therefore, oh, it's debunked. Then you get some 
fact checker that basically says, oh, you know, this has been fact checked check because Carolyn Ripple said, uh, you know, basically she couldn't get her science science right past junior high school. Uh, and then so can, you, you can we uh, an expert? Uh, one, one so you have an expert, yep. you, you basically then you, you fact check it out. And then then if anybody carries on, then you just exclude them, put you put them in, uh, you know, deplatform them and so um, and that's the end of it. That's that's our culture now. So yeah. so I so you think well you know what I'm realizing talking to like Spencer and he's all like no I want everything to be normalized and uh, you know talking to Allison and she's off on her little trip and then Faulty is doing something which is ludicrous. I mean ludicrous by his own philosophy standards. It's just an irrational act what he's doing now. So I realize all these people are off in the weeds, and I just say it's like you just got to cut the subtlety and just start beating people over the head with it, and say, "Dudes, you're wasting your fucking time." And so all this thing where I've been um, trying to be hedge, you know, I've been trying to like not put a timeline on it. I'm just, just going to say, look, you got to do this. You got just got to put a timeline on. You got to explain all of this to people and say you're wasting your fucking time. All of these things need to get, be put in, you know, we need to get our ducks in a row, get our story straight, and then just go out there and just be prepared to be considered as flat earthers. Um, because it, it really doesn't matter. It's just, it's just for, for us and, and basically our, our own integrity to tell people about it. it. You know, if we know this is coming, you need to tell people about it. And... I, I thought it was better not to tell people for a long time, but I think uh, it is survivable. And and the very first premise I'd like to push out there is that I I think it's survivable, and I personally w and m would like to survive it, and I, I would like my family to survive it, but I would like anybody to survive it. I'd like the billionaires, secretly. I don't want to tell people this, but, I, you know, I would like the billionaires, the psychopaths, all of these guys are... You know, it's better that some of them survive than no one. Uh, you know, the Piraha, the Aborigines, any anybody. It's better than nobody. So we, um, we is this the point? We, we need is this the point? We, we need a diversity of opinions and a diversity of strategies. So you don't want everybody to believe us. You don't want everybody to, you know, mm. if you want everybody to know that the flippening is going to happen basically with the catastrophes around the corner but because because they they leading a, a shitty life they lead a suboptimal life now that they wouldn't be leading if they knew that they had terminal cancer the equivalent the planetary equivalent of that so you're duty bound to tell them because they they they're living a shitty life in and, and stuck in a rut and you have to say look you've got to stop that but in terms of how you survive it survival strategies you want as diverse as possible and if yeah, a lot of people will just choose to be normies and that's okay if if they want to have kids now and a suburban lifestyle and try and emulate the 50s and just just kind of groove along and you know well they, they'll probably get 20 years of that life they, they can ha you can have a baby today and then yeah sure you're going to die horribly in 20 years or so but it's like you know, so what? You got, you had your, you know, think of it like a fairground. What you don't want is everybody to be in this fairground, A, to know that the fairground has a closing time and it's soon. That's not cool because people are dithering. So I don't think it's it's wise to let people dither and not uh, not use their time in the fairground. But So you have to tell them the fairground is, is ended. But apart from that, it's up to them. Whatever they do, they might choose to just carry on going, you know, make it the best fairground time they have. Some might go and cower in a corner. Some some might go and, you know, smell the roses. But all of those are good because you need a diversity of strategy if your aim is that somebody survives it. It is survivable, we know, because, you know, we've, we've experienced two or three Earth flips in, in humanity's um, existence. So as long as we've been homo sapiens, we've experienced a, a, at least two, maybe three flips. So what what's, what's dangerous now is that we've never had the Earth in such a degraded state. So all you see, 
particularly the oceans are basically to put a finer point on it this this society needs to be brought down quickly because it's it's ruining the oceans and nobody's going to survive if the oceans aren't intact uh, i can go over the the reasons for it but but you'll see if i'll go over exactly in the coming the coming meetings of, of, of what will happen likely to happen during the flip but you'll see that you don't the, the chance of you surviving on land are low you really it's you you have to be at the coast um to survive i don't believe anybody you see they're going to be big tidal waves and tsunamis volcanoes earthquakes and yeah can we can, I, I wanted to um get you onto this perhaps not in great detail because you just said you wanted to devote that to another meeting but just to give because i was sitting thinking about it and i thought look you know a people will look at that wingnut video and think oh you know, just like that but you know you're talking about a very large object here we're not talking about a little wingnut uh we're also talking about something that is not as noticeably unbalanced as the wingnut is i'm started to think so i started to think about well what would it look like for a person standing somewhere on the surface of the earth how quickly would they perceive these things happening? Um, and so, I don't know, do, do you want to just give a little potted, potted impression to people about your, your, you know, for a person, yeah, the little comment that I made there on the agenda, I just imagined a person standing at the North Pole who might end up at the South Pole, but, you know, the Earth could rotate in, at some other angle, of course. Um, and, you know, thinking about things like, well, would tall buildings be broken off by the acceleration uh, or, and this kind of thing, um, uh, you know, various things like that. It, it's, uh, and, of course, then you've got to deal with, of course, large amounts of liquid sloshing around uh, and, um, and sort of then sloshing back again. So I'll just shut up for a minute here. Have you got something you, you can say about that for a couple of minutes? Oh, shoot, you, oh, I think we lost him. I said connection lost. But um, I think I could- uh, You're muted, Gary. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah, so, sorry, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't realize he, he, he disappeared. But I think um, I read um, in Hugh's book, <clears> he mentioned, um, or I don't know if I want to mention it, but uh it should be gravity should be relatively stable right so yeah gravity is nice and the main things um, to worry about would be yeah the tsunamis the volcanoes and the earthquakes so anywhere where there's a fault line yeah where there's um yeah exactly we're uh west coast of the u.s we've already got wildfires we've got fault lines so that's a very risky area um you mentioned I was well, just it, um but, sorry um, go on certain areas oh, are well like if you're I was wondering poles, um it won't affect as much but um yeah I'd like you to talk about it more but in yeah yeah um, I mean oh go ahead Gary <laughs> yeah I I was just I, I was even before getting to the stage where earthquakes and uh well I mean to get tsunamis and that are obviously going to happen fairly well immediately but uh, i was just thinking of just a very simple model uh of um looking at that wing nut video and transferring that to the earth and it looks as though what happens is as it flips it does a half rotation and then continues its normal rotation so if you just looked at it as a simple thing and and Imagine that a person standing at the North Pole would end up being where the South Pole is now. And so they would, they would be having a journey of uh, the length of their journey would be half of the circumference of the Earth. Um, that's a 20,000 kilometer journey. Uh, and uh, I think in that video it also said there was conservation of angular velocity. So I'm assuming that that means that the speed of the flip 
is going to occur at the same speed that the Earth already rotates at normally. So it's going to accelerate from zero uh, at the North Pole in this example. Um, and, and uh, you know, I guess its average velocity over the trip from the North Pole to the South Pole is going to be about the same as the average velocity that the Earth's already running at, which means, you know, it's going to take um, 12 hours to accomplish this half rotation. Um, it's going to accelerate for the first 12 hours and then decelerate for the second uh, for the first six hours and then decelerate for the, for the second six hours. Um, but just looking at it, it, it seemed to me that the actual acceleration was not some neck snapping um, affair, that it was, you know, like actually a person would perceive it as being very mild. Um, and yet, of course, it's more than enough to move, you know, to leave water bodies behind and make them slosh around and all the rest of it. Uh, but but I guess, you know, I was basically just uh, wondering, uh, just interested to see what Hugh had to say about this, if he's actually thought about. Um, it's an interesting thought exercise because if, if you tell people about the flippening, it's a bit of an abstraction unless you can make it a bit more real for them. Um, and, you know, I think you have to make it real enough and say, hey, for you standing on the earth right now, if it started right now, this is what it would feel like for you. Um, uh, because even saying earthquakes and tsunamis, tsunamis is one thing, but, you know, we tend to make abstractions out of those as well because generally they, they end up happening to somebody else. Uh, most people don't live through them. Um, you know, so they've got that, uh, they've got that, they're a bit, a little bit, uh, abstract from that point of view. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Does anyone want to say something about that? Um, maybe we can talk about the movie 2012. I mean, I, I don't know. I could imagine. I'm just thinking back at that movie. Maybe, maybe that's a possibility. Like that's that reminds me of the flipping, but I don't know. I might be stretching it too far. You're muted again, Gary. Sorry, Mark. Uh, uh, I uh, I haven't seen that movie, but I may have heard about it. What, what was it about, just quickly? Mm, just major catastrophes hey, you hitting back? the planet yeah. Earth. It's a really imaginative movie, but... Uh, what yeah, that 2000, 2012 movie was like neutrinos, like messing with some magma in the Earth's core, and that causes the pole oh, flip yeah. or something. Yeah. It's based on one of those. Um, yeah. Can't remember what book it was based, like Hapgood or something. But yeah. 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 Oh, it's the um, good oh, estimation back, of back. the flipping. You'd say. Hugh, out of can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Q, what I was hoping you might be able to do, we were just talking about it while you were gone, was trying to make the flippening a little bit more real for people in their minds so that it was something that they could imagine themselves. Um, like, I mean, Mike yeah, was just saying, me... you know, tidal waves and, and earthquakes would be an, an outcome. But... Uh, it, it, if you look at what I wrote there under the agenda, I was trying to imagine it more from the point of view of a person standing somewhere. Um, what they would feel, whether they would feel much acceleration, um, uh, you know, whether things would fall over and, and just, you know, when I went through it, it seemed to be quite a slow, relatively slow thing where, you, you know, you, you wouldn't have... Um, you know, you wouldn't notice large inertia effects. But do you want to talk about that oh, for a bit and try and bring no, it alive? You're, you're not going to notice any inertia. So it's, funnily enough, um, if we're going to start popularizing this, the, it's a good place to start is a receptive audience is, funny enough, is, is uh, Muslims. Because it is described quite well in the Quran. <laughs> the, the, the last day is described. And, and what they describe is that um, there'll be a very, very long night and then um, the sun will rise uh, in the west. So um, 
you know, the sun, in case people don't know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But, um, uh, yeah, this is all common knowledge to Muslims, which is kind of funny for, you know, West, secular Westerners. <laughs> Muslims don't, it comes as quite a shock to then know that, no, the, this, is, this is standard orthodoxy in Muslims. But, so, what you will see is, depending on, uh, this is what I think, as far as I can tell, um, but I, I would encourage people to research it because I'd like to know more. And because nobody really knows, it's not really documented properly. Um, uh, you know, it's in folk memory, but it's not uh, a lot of it's supposition. Um, so, of especially what it will be like. Um, there's some geographic evidence. There's things like the mammoths. Um, you know, they they have. Uh, daisies in their stomachs you know that so they're obviously grazing on daisies in the morning and then they're frozen by the evening so you know that's flash freezing mammoth thing but again they say oh no that was debunked and it would the mammoth fell in a lake and it froze and it's like oh come on get real it, so the any any of these things people will have weak arguments that will be called debunking thorough debunked and then you know they'll come up with a flimsy argument and then say oh no but it's already been debunked and it's like horseshit your argument is so you've got to argue all of these points but anyway what it would be like and subject to a lot of argument which we should have and uh, a lot of debate about what it will be really like but depending on whether it's night or day if it's daylight you would experience the the first thing you experience is that the sun would stay up, or the sun would would stay in the sky or, and start reversing. All of this would happen in about twenty four hours, so the, a very short period of time. But if you're in the if it's night time, you have a very long night. Um, but Hang on, it, can I can I just intervene? It yeah. is, uh, uh I just want to clarify something from the uh, the wingnut video. Was it looked to me? I was assuming that what was happening, that the half rotation proceeded at the same velocity as the normal rotational speed. And therefore, the yeah. half rotation would take as long in, as um, half of a normal rotation of the wing nut before it started to flip. So it, it, I don't know whether you agree with that. So the, would that mean that the, if the Earth did flip, that it would, it would start and end in, in 12 hours? I thought it was 24. No, we're talking about a half rotation. Oh, it's a half rotation. The, the, yeah, the wing that does a half rotation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely right. But um, the only thing is, though, that uh, it starts off slowly. So the um, and uh, stops abruptly. If you have a look at the wing night, I think it's, it shows you pretty much the, the he showed, the yeah, where, where he showed the flat disc with the two small weights that became perturbed, the acceleration was initially very gentle. It, 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 it increased to a maximum at, at, at a quarter of the rotation, in other words, halfway through the flip. Uh, uh, so the, it was increasing for a quarter of the rotation or half the flip and and then it went into a deceleration down to zero in the second quarter but it was always except for that instantaneous point it was either accelerating or decelerating it, it was it was not uniform so i mean at, at at all points you will be noticing some inertia effect uh, uh, i'm no, just imagining I, I don't think you'll notice any, you won't feel any inertia so you Things well, are not going to go flying off tables, and you're not going to go and flying off. No, no, I don't tables. mean. I don't mean on a grand scale, but there will be some measurable inertia. You, you won't. You won't feel it. But what? It, it's tidal forces. So, so what will happen is there'll be very dramatic tides. Um, so, you know, we're talking like 300 meter waves, that kind of thing. So, okay, so. I mean, immediately people are thinking in terms of how, how to survive it and where you should be. Well, <laughs> the reason why I'm on a boat is because I think you should be on a boat. And I'll talk you through the logic of it. Is the, the, what you'd notice first, say it was daylight, was that the, the sun would hang in the sky and it would be 
okay, first of all, nobody's going to know what's happening. You're not going to get on your cell phone and hear on the news and stuff. Um, religious people are immediately going to be saying, oh, it's the rapture and falling on their knees and running around hysterically and stuff in the street. Um, but uh, you, you would see the sun stay for a long time, like hours, at say, you know, it's a, some stay, stay up and then start reversing across the sky uh, to, towards uh, the east. So uh, when that happens, there'll be, there's, the Earth is under, the Earth's crust is under tremendous stress. And so there'll be a lot of um, seismic activity, a lot of earthquake. Um, and associated with that under CC slides, a lot of um, mountain um, avalanches, uh, and, and so those will also precip precipitate tsunamis. Now, you might think, well, you don't want to be on a boat because, like, if it's tsunamis, you want to be far inland. But I'll go over why <laughs> that's not a good strategy. Actually, what land, land arbors don't know is that in some tsunamis and earthquakes, you really do want to be on a boat, especially as far out as sea as possible. I've had earthquakes in, in Greece already. Didn't feel them at all. People on the land were, like, kind of freaked out and was like, didn't feel a damn thing. <coughs> the thing is, uh, in the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, the volcanoes, you can't tell whether the volcano will go off or not. But or what there was what's noted or not, noticeable about all these uh, the ge geologic records of these things is is that the massive volcanic activity. So the volcanic activity plunges the earth into nuclear winter or you know in this case volcanic winter um so you don't want to be say in the middle of russia or something like that because you might survive the volcanoes and the earthquakes but then your biggest problem is that there's a big freeze afterwards and you'd have to you know in, if you imagine the worst winters you've ever seen you would have to then get to the coast because the, the, there'll be extremes of temperature in the mid uh, mid continents, so you won't be able to find food and survive. So you, you need to be on the coast because the the, earth, the sea has a a high thermal inertia. So marine life, you particularly want to protect marine life, especially from this the last stages of this industrial society, because. The marine life is liable to survive pretty well. It's kind of like a Noah's Ark thing. By the way, this is, Noah's Ark and Deucalion and the Epic of Gilgamesh, all the folk memories of a flood that we have, are actually, um, that's a different thing. This, that is, the last flippening, uh, it was probably about twelve or 13,000 years ago, just before Gobekli Tepe. So the flipping precipitates civilization. It kind of causes it, but the uh, at least for the Aryans. Um, so the the uh, yeah, that's it's just at the end of the, it. It precipitates the the younger Dryas. Um, so if you imagine, you know, you don't want to. You want to be in a coastal area, but. When the actual flipping is happening, that's where you know all the volcanic activity is. That's where the tsunamis are and things like that. So it makes sense to me to be on a boat because you can survive tsunamis very well as long as you're far away from the shore. It's just a big swell. Um, what about the, the um... and the volcanoes? Um, you know, and, and the thing is, you want to be mobile. You don't know. You see, all the last flipping, all the megafauna died off. All the, all the animals you see today did fine. So reptiles and crocodiles and cold-blooded animals, they survived somewhere. So it's, it's hard to figure out where exactly uh, to be and to, to survive. But everybody went, you know, especially the humans, went through a fantastic population bottleneck. But they did survive. So, you know, so it makes sense. You want to be mobile and not over land. Um, you don't want to start trekking through snow <laughs> stuff after that. So it makes sense to me just like to be like Noah and be in a boat um, and 
yeah, but yeah, but you've still got this question of what what axis the the uh, the rotation is going to occur around. I mean, the, the the Earth is a much more complex body regarding the distribution of its mass than those simple examples, uh, you know, on those videos. Um, and you know, whilst it's very obvious that we're seriously perturbing the mass distribution, uh, you know, I mean, how how practical how practical uh, a, a project is it to be trying to calculate what what the likely axis of rotation is, is going to be? Well, um, you need supercomputers to do it. It's there's it's fantastically complicated because. Um, it, to actually predict when it happens is is hard enough. Um, but the you know it you you continually have to tell people no, it's not the magnetic pole shift that's something different. Now that's a bit of a simplification because the magnetic pole mu, pole shift must be associated somehow. There might be a magnetic pole shift during this time. But it's all to do with the fluid dynamics of the mantle, and people don't, we don't really know what the Earth's core is like um, in, in great detail or how uh, the fluid dynamics of it, how it flows and stuff. So it's difficult to model, but, but yeah, one of the things you might have to contend with is ultraviolet light because of the, you know, the, the pole, the magnetic poles might weaken, the, the Van Allen belt might weaken. And so, in the middle of all this volcanic activity and this uh, global dimming, the the sun, you know, might uh, if there, if there's any solar flare or something at the same time, you, you're in deep shit. But I, one of the I, mm. see, okay, I just I just want to say that that, that mm. my gut feel personally, my hunch is that you'll get warnings. So so you you're. you're you'll start to see, you can model it in the computer, but not very successfully, though the, the governments have, the Soviets and the US have. I, I get the impression the Chinese and the Indians and all the, South Asia is going to be not a good place to be, as far as I can see. And I get the impression, judging by Xi and the way, the posture, all these, by these guys' body language and their policies, is that they don't, they don't know about it. Uh, so it's it's high, all this stuff is highly classified. They they um, but anyway, I always thought that you would get some some warnings. You would get some warnings from animals. You, I mean, on on the actual day, animals are very sensitive to um, you know shifts in the earth and stuff. They can predict earthquakes and stuff like that. What about uh, people with um, psychic abilities? You know. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, you, you know, you, you will see some very weird shit, but the people won't know how mm. to interpret it. But one, yeah. one of the things you're going to see, uh, and I, I want to go over all of these things, so you'll so because the major thing is people won't know what's happened; they'll just know that something fucking weird is going on. But before before that, you're liable to see, funnily enough, a lot of flying saucers, <laughs> a lot of UFOs. Now, you know. This is going to be the craziest time you've, you've ever had. The, the reason for the UFOs is the Earth is made of silica and it's piezoelectric. So and when you put it under pressure, you get a lot of these electric effects. So you'll get all sorts of funny things like ball lightning and stuff through 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 various areas. But there was this case in, in Mexico where this volcano went off and millions of people witnessed this UFO is basically what what they are a couple of UFOs information what they are is their electrical phenomena they, they lenticular clouds in other words um, but what it's because the earth is you know we don't give enough credit to how um, the the electromagnetic earth and space and how important electromagnetism is it's kind of disregarded we think it's all about gravity and stuff and, and you know NASA has a lot of trouble with electromagnetism and stuff, but they don't, it's not really in the public consciousness. But in these kind of events, you'll see a lot of weird electromagnetical magnetic things. So that alone might affect the, the magnetic poles. It'll certainly affect the weather. 
So you will see all these weird things. I keep on posting things, just kind of drip feeding people about, um, you know, the unusual earthquakes, um, an increase in volcanic and um, seismic activity. Now, I keep on looking to see if, if seismic activity is increasing and volcanic activity is increasing, and they keep on saying, no, it's just because they're reporting it. But from what I can see, it is, in, is increasing. Although yeah, you, the USPS on that insists that it's it's not. It's just the reporting. But if you go and look at the records, they, they it's increasing dramatically, the number of you, earthquakes. Okay. Yeah, you want to hear something really crazy? So ever since, I, I don't know, I think the algorithm kind of tapped into my wavelength because ever since I read your book, YouTube tells me when a new volcano starts erupting. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's and then like a new earthquake or whatever yeah it's not it's like the other day i got i don't know this is like a couple of weeks ago or something i got the notification that iceland volcano started erupting so yeah it's like youtube tapped into my wavelength and is giving me the info so it's like oh shit <laughs> yeah the algorithm um, looks at the words and it'll pick up the words in this video so if you watch this video don't be surprised if you start getting uh, the, the algorithm starts referring you to the, uh, I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give the algorithm a decent clue in just a moment um, but uh, the uh, if I could just make a comment that uh, you you were talking about warnings you know animals sensing it and that kind of thing and uh, people may be sensing it but they don't know uh, but I'm also thinking there's another aspect to people sensing it uh, which is something that I've experienced sometimes very strongly, um, being absolutely consumed with the sensation that there's something terribly wrong, like as though, as though there's literally some kind of disaster quite close by, but absolutely no evidence of it. Nothing I can find, nothing in the news, nothing I can see or hear. I can't confirm it in any way. Um, it's not hard to imagine that under a circumstance like that where people are actually sensing perhaps this flip if it's starting, that they can't attribute it, and therefore they're kind of filling it in with perceived events that might not actually be there. So, I mean, from that point of view, they could be seeing flying saucers or some other phenomena uh, or, or, you know, really genuinely experiencing something just out of um, kind of subconsciously filling in the... the, the uh, the, the vacuum of clues, you know, the world, because what they've got is this very strong intuition, this very strong feeling, but no way to to get a confirmation for it. Um, yes. I mean, you're seeing all the UFO reports now and, um, and, and things like that, but there are a number of things happening simultaneously. And it's, and, uh, you know, I mean, scientists and that are, well, they're different, different types of scientists. They're government scientists, and there are people that know about this, but it's all classified. So you have to separate them into civilian scientists are clueless. They they have their heads up their ass and they know nothing about this. And if you if you told them, they would go all Michael Shermer because it upsets their normalcy bias. And then they'll start saying, oh, debunking. And then if when things get worse, it'll be conspiracy theorists. And then it'll be deplatforming and you know they'll they're pretty soon this will be a QAnon conspiracy you know you, you they have to say all that because they don't want to face the fact that their whole life's work things like you know Bill McGibbon and Michael and Mann and Hansen and stuff they want to believe they have to for their own psychological well-being they have to believe that there's human agency that it's all about climate change and you know this they you know we must stick to the political agenda and it's about bright green lies and green tech and you know all it's like that guys that's fantasy it's fucking out of fantasy so you know um and, and this thing you know just like faulty like extinction rebellion that kind of thing is like they they need to believe that you know the government can do something well okay well i guess this is a good point to actually tell people what the flippening is um I, I know Petra didn't know about it and stuff. So, uh, okay. So, here's here's the 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 skinny of what what the flipping is. But a lot of in history, is, you know, there's the legend of Atlantis. There's Solon. It's mentioned in um, in Plato and stuff about uh, you know this 
about there's always this persistent flood legend there's lots of indication that you know there's a mystery for why the ice ages occurred and they say oh, it's milankovitch cycles is the official story but milankovitch cycles don't work um they don't fit with the geological record and stuff so um so anyway uh charles hapgood um, in the 1950s, he came from the point of view of all these different pieces of evidence, and he didn't much believe in continental drift. The continental drift is for real; it's it's been measured with, you know. But um, but uh, yeah, um, he was wrong about continental drift. That is is correct. He was right about the flip. What um, Divine Beast posted that thing about earth crust displacement. His theory was earth crust displacement because he thought of the crust floating on this big molten mantle. He never thought the whole bloody thing could move. So he contacted Einstein. He sent a letter to Einstein. Einstein really liked the, the evidence that he had and was really captivated by the whole idea. Um, he wrote the, Einstein wrote the, the introduction to Hapgood's book, um, about earth crust displacement in the 1950s, about 1958 or so, something like that. Um, I, so Einstein was never very good at uh, circular motion, centripetal force and stuff here, kind of mental block there. If you listen to Einstein's uh, explanation of, say, tidal forces, then, um, you know, it, if Einstein was vision of, of tidal forces was correct, there would be only one tide a day and um, you know the Earth would only bulge on one side. <laughs> so Einstein didn't understand tidal forces. Uh, he he didn't understand uh, circular motion in general. <clears throat> and so he looked at Hapgood's theory and stuff. He he eventually went a bit cold on it. He he cooled off on the idea because he couldn't find a a, a force big enough to actually shift the crust. So the actual you know. Hapgood thought that, you know, the snow built up on the North and South Pole. Um, it's, it's complicated by the fact that I don't think Hapgood accounted for the rebound of effect. <clears throat> Just a heads up. One of the things people will tell you is, no, this theory is bullshit, because the weight of the ice um, is equalized because it, it compresses the mantle. So in other words, you know, it just sinks. It's like having a big lump of ice on a spongy bed, you know, on a spongy mattress. And the ice just sinks into the mattress and then basically the, the, the center of inertia doesn't change. Well, that's bullshit because uh, in this case, it the North and South Poles don't really matter. The North Pole, because it's the ice is floating on water, the, the South Pole, the Antarctic, uh, because it is symmetric with the, the geographic pole. So it doesn't have a lot of effect. The, the two asymmetries, the huge asymmetries, are the Greenland ice sheet, which is a tremendous, um, a tremendous weight, and then the the Hindu Kush uh, Himalaya field, the, the, you know, uh, what they call the third pole. So it's it's those two poles that are the important one: the Greenland ice sheet and the the Himalayan pole. So. If you watch that video from uh, Veritasium, it's very good introduction. It's 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 kind of tragic because he ends that video saying, uh, you know, he goes through all of the thing and then he ends the video saying, but Earth is spinning around its um, its uh, axis of spin. maximum momentum, wasn't it? Yeah, maximum inertia. Axis of momentum. Which and is that, the minimum minimum is kinetic energy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so he's saying, and that is stable, and that's yeah. how you end the well. It's not stable because it was stable for all of the Holocene because the temperatures were <coughs> were 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 very stable, I believe, because of human activity. We were holding holding it in check, and it was in dynamic equilibrium because it was holding our agriculture and our activities in check and I, I believe that's why the Holocene was was flat was temperatures were stable and flat uh, the conventional wisdom is it was just a freak accident that they were flat it doesn't have an explanation and there were few humans to influence the climate bullshit we're great at making fires 
Um, and uh, we, as fast as we did, we did agriculture as fast as we could and then held the, the earth in check. So, so what's been happening over the earth's history is and what causes ice ages is, this, is the continue is basically this. The ice builds up uh, because uh, there's a lot of CO2, the greenhouse effect, um, and the plum <clears throat> feed off that CO2. It is plant food and they grow happily. They suck over millions of years, they suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere, which causes a freezing and causes the ice age. <clears throat> it doesn't just end there because <clears throat> that causes the ice to build up and and it, ups, uh, it upsets the Earth. It basically makes Earth into a, a three-axis body, like kind of like your cell phone or a book or a tennis racket. And the tennis racket then makes a dramatic flip. What that causes is masses of volcanic activity. The volcanic activity shoots up in the air uh, all these sulfates, um, and you get a volcanic winter after that until all the sulfates fall down. That takes about, you know, a few years, um, what takes over then is massive heating because the volcanoes then let out a whole lot of greenhouse gases that then warm the, the atmosphere and then that all the plants recover, suck the CO2 and that's the cycle. So um, that the, the last one is probably about 70,000 years ago than the most recent one about 13 or 12,000 years ago, the younger Dryas. Um, and so, anyway, Hapgood figured this out, but he, he got stuck on crustal displacement, and he, he couldn't think, it, he didn't know about the tennis racket effect. Um, so what happens is, what's happening now is, we, since the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution was the biggest mistake anybody could ever make, because we were holding the temperatures flat during the Holocene, and then they suddenly take off like a rocket. Uh, because of the greenhouse gas emission because of us burning fossil fuels what's that what that's doing is melting the the himalayas the third pole and it's melting the greenland ice ice cap now when you hear people talk about melting the greenland ice cap scientists say um, they don't first they don't know much about it um, and so they say they're thinking in terms of a big ice cube sitting on top of uh, greenland uh, and it's melting. So then they say, oh, it's centuries, maybe a thousand years for Greenland ice to melt. No, you've got it entirely wrong. It's, it's structural decay. So it's more like an avalanche. Think of it more like a rickety old brick house. And the melting, it's not melting of this big block of ice. It's really like, imagine all the mortar in this rickety old brick house. The mortar between the bricks got weathered away. And then basically it falls off in chunks. That's what's happening to Antarctica right now. I mean, I mean the Greenland ice sheet right now. So it's structural decay. It's not melting is the way to see it. It's just the melting is just lubricating bits that are falling off in big chunks. Now, the thing is, so, uh, so anyway, it ended with Hapgood not making any headway because it was too unconventional. Um, he didn't like... Um, uh, he didn't like uh, continental drift just at the point when a theory was be being started to be accepted. Um, and if, so a number of reasons Hap, uh, Hapgood was forgotten um, until, um, but mainly because they couldn't find a force that could move the earth, the, you know, the, the huge inertia involved. Um, so uh, that lasted until, uh, well, in the meantime, there was the limits to growth. In 1972, they came up with the limits to growth, and they and they computer they modeled the future of Earth as cyberneticists, the Forrester, and all of these guys and all um, all these NGOs. They they um, they decided that we were in big trouble because of the population bomb, because of the whole trajectory we were on was pretty well terminal, starting around 2020. Funny enough. <laughs> So uh, they basically they they modeled it and they said, well, if you ca we carry on like this, we're fucked by tw in 2020. Everything goes wrong. Um, so there, so that's how it was left until the 80s. Then uh, the next part of the story is comes um, Vladimir 
Zanibekov, cosmonaut Vladimir Zanibekov. He um, he was uh, on a mission to Soyuz, a very dramatic story in itself. Um, he was just un unpacking a crate that had a wing nut on it, and he flipped the wing nut with his finger, ding, like this, and went spinning, and then like came off the thread and went, you know, floating in space. And he was amazed that it suddenly flipped without any external force, which is completely anti Michael Shermer, anti physics. Um, and then he watched it and it flipped back again the other way. And he, he was absolutely amazed. And so he started experimenting. He found that he could easily do it with a wing, wing nut. And so he um, now, yeah, and he broadcast it back to the, the um, ground station and told these guys. Um, and they were all a bit fascinated. But of course, instantly they thought of the Earth. <laughs> And they thought, well, if, if this happens in stuff in space, could it happen to the Earth? And so what he did was he, um, uh, he got a bit of Play-Doh, I mean, plasticine, you know, modeling clay, which I don't know why they had it on <laughs> the sides, but they did. He put the wing, modeling clay around the, the wing nut to make it a sphere to see if it still did it. And it did it. As soon as he did that, he showed the guys on video, and the, they instantly classified it. Um, the Soviets classified it um, because you know th that was about as bad as it gets. Um, they, the Americans, independently found the same effect because I think it was could be wrong, but it was um, the first communication satellite, um, Intelsat or whatever it was called. I can't remember what it was, the first one was called, but it had a big antenna on it. And uh, the antenna may, turned it into a three axis body in effect. Um, and, uh, and so it flipped. Um, various spacecraft, I think, have flipped. They classified them. I think John Glenn, his space flip, I think he, his one flipped. They've been very careful to have retro rockets and stuff to stop satellites and bodies, you know, spacecraft and that that flipping, um, but it's uh, definitely a, a danger. Um, they spin. The US has things called spinners that spin very fast to deflect cosmic dust and um, debris. Uh, you know, basically, if it's, if it's spinning with high centrifugal force, it can deflect the things that's more um, maintainable. Little little classified secret I'm telling you. <laughs> there, um, so the, uh, but anyway, this is well known in space agencies. If the Chinese don't know about this, they're going to find out as the space, <laughs> and then the Indians too are going to find out as the space um, programs progress. Um, so uh, yeah, so then um, the, the, so from what I can gather, then it gets starts to get speculative after that. So after this, after the Soviet discovery, they they classified it for about 10 years, then they they declassified it. Um, uh, part, I'm not really sure why they declassified it, but uh, in essence, from what I have managed to piece together, the, 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 the way it went down in the US uh, and um, in, you know, when you say something like, oh, the US government knows this, well, it's, you know, it's not a homogeneous monolithic organization. The, the, the various factions, the various departments, some of them are secret. But the guys that pull the strings and make the policy, they know this. And then from what I can tell, they're basing the pol their policy on it. So the mystery, in case you're an, envi an activist environmentalist, is why governments, and especially the Five Eyes governments and stuff, are so lax about climate change and stuff is that um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much fossil fuel you burn now. Um, it's uh, the, they, they, they did some research in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s in, in Greenland, and they came to the conclusion that it's already past the tipping point. So the, the Arctic is gonna melt 
the Greenland has passed a tipping point. So whatever we do, if we do geoengineering, if we transition to a green economy, go for, go for it. It's it's kind of like that the thing in um, Hitchhiker's Guide that uh, DB posted there. You know, it's like Arthur Dent is in the in the thing. He says. Oh, the one uh, here, the drinks are in me, uh, you know, uh, the world's about to end. And he says, well, shouldn't we put a, like a paper bag over our head and lie on the floor? He says, yeah, you can if you like. It's not going to help. So, yeah, go for it. You can do green thing. You can burn fossil fuels. Do whatever you fucking want. Not going to change the um, outcome. Here, it might have been Paul Beckwith or one of those other little talks from uh, the Glasgow con conference. Uh, at any rate, somebody mentioned there, they described Greenland as the last remaining evidence of of the last major ice age, uh, or the last surviving part, I mean. Um, and they said that, that it, it really, even at the best of times, it was only just hanging on uh, because it was really a re formed in, in a past situation which doesn't exist anymore. And it, yes. it, it was really just just what was left. And so, uh, what's happening now? It very very easily throws it into a terminal decline because it was already yes, really sitting right on the edge of that anyway. You know. Yeah, it, it's it's a relic. So so what happened in the um, in the previous ice sheet was the Lor the Laurentide ice sheet over North America. It was the the displacing mass. Uh, the change the axis. So um, when it went, it had a big lake in the middle, and and that lake cascaded out. Uh, the Badlands in America, you can go there and you can have a look. You can, it's evident to your eye that there was a massive flood, and that was uh, basically the meltwater from this big lake that was starting to melt on the the Laurentide ice sheet. But when the the Laurentide ice sheet melted, it it flipped the earth. Um, the Greenland was a little piece left on the side, um, and so so yeah, it's it's. You see, I I am very suspicious about these reports. You see, uh, anything I hear about Greenland, and they they normally say they're very careful to say, oh, it's all about sea level rise. And say, Look, you can forget about sea level rise. This sea level rise is the absolute least of your problems. <clears throat> the, I think they. I'm always a bit suspicious that they are putting out deliberate disinformation. So they want people, A, to think that the Greenland's ice sheet will melt over centuries. And the biggest risk is sea level rise, because they don't want you to know what the real risk is. Um, um, so I get the impression that the, they, you know, they want to depopulate the Earth. They want a reset. They want a great reset. And so it's, uh, if you... And, and they, from what I can tell, not, the people that know intend to survive it. So I'm not in touch enough to know details, but my guess is a lot of this is supposition. But all the thing about, you know, I suspect billionaires and one or two billionaires in this, one of their strategies is to be in space when the flip happens. So you... Uh, I don't think that's a good strategy. I think it's, and I lay out in my book, <laughs> I don't think it's a good strategy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's good. I mean, any, you know, do anything. We want to hold, we want to survive this. We want somebody to survive it, even if it's them. So anything is good, any theory, any anything. If people think, yeah, they can survive it in a bunker or up on a mountain, it's like, it's all good. Um, the, the ramifications of actually popularizing this is, um, in in my view, is it, I think what we must do and what next is uh, is a a manifesto. So do an extinction RT manifesto. And the reason for it is, people have been pointing out to me that the that my thinking is not entirely consistent um, on on all of the topics that we we cover, and that's true. Um, how it turns out, if you if you get, we, we need to make sure that all our thinking is aligned, all our, our policies are all straight, and we don't have any contradictions in our hypothesis and stuff. But, you know, it's the kind of things people are pointing out to me is like, there's no, I always rail against people that say, oh, you mustn't do stuff to, to end the industrial civilization, you shouldn't try and 
monkey wrench it or something like that. People just say, oh, you can sit back and watch. And I always rail against that, but the truth the truth is it is okay to sit back and watch. <laughs> yeah. there, there was an aspect to this um, I was just thinking about the other day was think just thinking about that, you know, monkey wrenching and, and various things. But, you know, really when you look at it, isn't isn't humanity bringing down the planet by the quickest possible path already just by doing what it's already doing like just yep. let it let it rip because you know you could get a lot of a lot of uh, independent actors out there trying to hasten the process but you know as you pointed out the other day the system will will aggressively try and build itself back and repair those things and recover any damage that they do um, yeah, that's kind of the problem with 500 lone wolves is mm. that it's difficult to find 500 people. And you would think in 8 billion people, look, there are a lot of people out on the dark web. There are a lot of um, people, uh, you know, in cyberspace that are hackers and things like that that are working to bring the system down. Um, they, they might, but you look how slowly they're going. I mean, I keep on posting things that I think that is them. But, you know, like the, you know, you can get a freighter and you can block up the sewers for a while and stuff. A lot of these things that they're doing, they, they you know, you might bring down the grid and stuff like that. But, but uh, it's difficult to see how they can actually do it permanently. The, the single biggest thing, look, you want to be accelerationist. The longer industrial civilization carries on, the less chance any survivors of the flipping will have. They won't have the resources. What we're doing is we're destroying the oceans in particular. And so we every day that the flipping is delayed, it means that the survivors have less chance. Look, the current, the current civilization is, um, is shitty. The suicide rate is high. Everybody's discontent. It's it's fucking. We're living in hell, guys. Uh, the sooner Agreed. that it ends, the better. You know, you want to you want to accelerate it. Um, you want to accelerate it just from the humanitarian point of view. Is if you say, well, you know, oh, why do you want to accelerate the the flipping and stuff? Well, say like, you know, if you care about humans, that every you know, if you in the nine months it has to just it takes to gestate a baby, a hundred million people are added to the planet. So we are heading for eleven million. So we're we're about eight eight billion. I mean billion. So we're at about eight billion now. You want to add an extra three billion that are going to go through this hell and possibly a large part of how people die if they don't die in the fires. There'll be a lot of fires after these earthquakes, especially in cities. You don't die in a fire or an earthquake if you basically if you don't die in a frost, then you you're probably going to die. Most people are probably going to die of hunger. It is a horrible way to die. You do not want to add three billion people in the death throes of this civilization. You don't want to add three billion people so that they can suffer and die from starvation. Can, can so I just address? I, I want to just address the point there here from what you're just saying now about contradiction and i'm not coming at this i'm not down on you at all in any way for, for for being contradictory at times um but um there's contradiction at, a, at another level and that is for instance at other times where you've said well it doesn't matter whether a, a child born today has a very short life um uh you know because um uh their life is as long as it is and and uh you know it's fulfilling or it's got whatever it's got in its own way and and it, the question is not how long it was um and there's already so there's a bit of a contradiction there in what you're saying but but you know i'm not not making a point no, of it no uh, no just, i don't think so uh, no no i don't think all... so what, what's bad is if people have babies thinking that they're going to grow old it's so the yeah the, you see, I'm, but see, we got we got other we got others. Just, just before on, you go, I base it, I base it on right. things like, like um, uh, people that I know that have a Down syndrome kid. Now that kid's not going to survive past twenty, but 
they love the kid. They know that it's a very short time that they have. They don't have any delusions about the kid's going to grow up and get married and stuff. And and they, 20 years having it is fine. Anyway, talking about time horizons, then I, this is something I always avoid. But I'll tell you now, at the risk of being disappointed of what I think the time horizon is. So the, the Greenland ice sheet, as I said, is, 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 it's going to go very, very quickly. It's already going. Um, so we, so the question, it doesn't all have to go for the earth to flip. In fact, from what I know, it only needs about one to 5% of what it was since the industrial revolution. So in other words, we're already there. It could flip at any day. We, we already have enough ice loss from the Greenland ice sheet for it to flip today. Now, it's very, very hard because there's so many factors involved of when actually the flip happens. You just know at some point in the melt it happens, starting from today. The thing is that as each day goes on, the chances that it is this, the, the day, the chances that the flipping in happens increase dramatically. And the reason is this. This, is, and this gives you an idea of what I secretly have in mind, which I don't tell people, is this kind of timeline. As, uh, just before I do this, I just just let me switch uh, the engine off. Hang on one second. I'll be back in two seconds. Wow. He, he didn't lie when someone said all will be revealed. Yeah, I. <laughs> so yeah, I'm back. Uh, so oh. okay, so this is this is what I think will happen. Is is, um, uh, the uh, if you ask observational cryologists, basically people that study the ice, the modeling guys write them off. Uh, modeling is just how you know ways of lying with a computer. It's just you might as well work it out on a on a handkerchief. I don't take any of the computer modelers seriously, A, because I've done it, <laughs> and it's all bullshit. So it's far too complex to, to model in any great detail. It's just, a, it's just a way of putting your opinion into a computer and making it sound more, more real than it is. So you've got to listen to the observational guys. There are two flavors of them. The military guys, they know shit, and they're not going to tell you. So you cannot, you don't know where they're coming from. They have agendas, right? So you can't believe government scientists, right? So then that leaves the, the few civilian scientists, people like Shakova, uh, Igor Samolotov, and those guys. I believe those guys, because, and Peter Wadhams, uh, guys like that. The, the reason the reason is, is they're not insiders, and they're actually reporting what they're seeing, and that's the important thing. So what they say, if you take a little survey of them, they they privately will not they won't say this publicly but privately they all think uh, the, the blue ocean event the arctic's going to go ice free so, somewhere after about 2025 somewhere between 2025 and 2030 when the arctic goes ice free the, you know the first ice free summer um that blue ocean event things are going to move very fast after that so the, you can forget Caroline Ruppel and Cage and the USGS putting out all their disinformation. Is the the, the Cuthred gun is real? <laughs> it's going to blow. Um, it has a two meter cap on it, and there's already you're seeing these temperature anomalies in the sea. There, Caroline Ruppel keeps on going on about this bullshit about all oh, the Cuthreds are like 100 meters to 300 meters. There's tons of them. She admits um, all around the world, but it's like no. Carolyn, you fucking climate criminal. The East Ice is about, you know, two thirds the size of Europe. There's 15 kilometers of clathrates underneath them, and it has a two meter cap on it. It's it's like a piece of wet paper over stuff that floats. You know, imagine a piece of wet paper underwater holding down 15 kilometers worth of styrofoam, just ready to float to the surface. It's like. So it, you know, she says, "Oh, it'll be you know 
the methane would be dissolved in the column of water coming up. It's like rubbish. It's basically, it's all to do with this, this, it's how dramatic the eruption is. It's all to do with the sphere, you know, the, the size of the bubble, right? So in other words, it, the, it can only diffuse through the, through the outer membrane of a bubble. So if you have a massive eruption, there isn't enough surface area for it to diffuse in the column. And at 60, 60 meters, it's already fucking erupting. The seeps are going nuts in the Arctic already, and they're all getting to the surface. Go and read the fucking papers. So you're lying. You And I think they're doing it deliberately because they 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 kind of divert people uh, from the from the clathrate gun hypothesis. But anyway, the, the clathrate gun, again, is one of those things that could go off at any time, but it's definitely going to go off after the BOE because basically this, it's... It's so fragile already. It's and then um, when when that happens, there's going to be a lot, a lot of methane. Methane is variously toted at 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas. But but the when you hear of the BOE, you know we're on the short fuse. Like we're talking, you haven't got many years. You know, three, <laughs> one. <laughs> something like that um but that it's gonna go and it's and so the first thing that's that's gonna happen is um thing that mcpherson carries on saying or keeps on saying and that's that you know it'll be impossible to grow and store transport grains at scale and that's that's for reals the whole world survives on grains rice and and um, and wheat and so they that's going to um that, that you're going to have failed crops that that year, and the and then the it'll I think people will barely notice that the Greenland ice sheet is decaying fast. It's just crumbling like a um, so that'll that'll happen quickly, and then then uh, the Earth flip will happen soon after that. So it gives you an idea of my kind of thinking is like BOE about two, somewhere between 2025 to 2030. Uh, this story is really over fast after, and the, it might, you know, it might be decades uh, for the, uh, for, it's possible that it takes till 2100 um, to, for the, you know, for enough of the green and ice sheet to melt to cause the flipping. But I think it's a lot less. I think it's much closer to the BOE kind of like straight away but you'll you'll know because it'll happen rapidly it'll big pieces will big pieces already sloughing off <laughs> okay you know you saw that video with the size of manhattan coming off there is like dudes this show's almost over so the so yeah so that's that's my thinking on it in terms of it makes it kind of funny in terms of things like geoengineering so geoengineering can't I think we must write down in a manifesto exactly what our policy is on each one of these things and make sure our thinking is all consistent and we've got it. Because, because um, I, as people have pointed out, my thinking is, and what I've been saying is not entirely consistent. But so, so we must iron all of those those details out. But the, you, you see, uh, if you just upfront about the flipping and say you want to accelerate it. Then you say, well, geoengineering is not really quite as much of a risk as I've been saying because um, geoengineering will, it's, it's can't stop the, it, it can't really even delay it much because although they, you don't want to do geoengineering, you really, really don't want to do it because uh, there's going to be so much volcanic activity that you, you, you're going to have like 3% global dimming that you're going to do that like david keith wants to do well that's three percent and then you've got an untold amount of volcanic activity around the pacific rim in terms of places where you don't want to be is you don't want to be on the east coast of america because of all the tsunamis and flooding you don't want to be anywhere near yellowstone the antarctic has about 70 volcanoes and i have been pitched to blow uh, 70 volcanoes under the ice uh, anywhere around the Pacific Rim, those volcanoes are bad. But anyway, you don't know which volcanoes are going to go off. Personally, what, I'm in the in the spot which I think, and you can see in the book in my book, I actually name 
the exact zero coordinates of the spin. My way of thinking is you want to be at the spin axis because that, that's where the centrifugal forces will be and tidal forces will be least. So there's one just off New Zealand. And, uh, they, hint, hint. That's why some of these guys are going to New Zealand, guys. Uh, so uh, and and so so do I expect everybody to like suddenly flood to Greece and buy? But no, because a they're not going to believe me, and um, uh, and the guys that do know they're already here. The the other thing is you want different strategies, so you don't want to entirely believe me. Um, but uh, some of the evidence I put in my book is why I think this is a good spot. Um, is Santorini, as far as I can tell, it didn't. So, <clears throat> so Greek is Greece is seismically seismically active and it has volcanoes. Um, but from the last flipping, which I presume the, is the same flip axis, so I think it was the same flip axis or, more, or thereabouts. Um, so. Uh, yeah, um, Santorini didn't blow last time, so my bet is that it won't blow now. You really don't want to be near Santorini if it does blow. Um, um on both New Zealand's got the same, New Zealand's got the same problem though, it's on that edge of the ring of fire. When I looked at the uh, opposite uh point on the pole from from where you were it, it was actually closer to the east coast of australia than it was to to new zealand um, yeah the east coast so of australia is, is is good place to be mm -hmm. yeah. um, um can i can i just bring in uh something a little bit different uh because we were talking you were, you've mentioned a couple of times there about how the military probably know the government certain people in government would know, but they're all obviously going to keep very quiet about this. Uh, and, um, you know, you've got the people who really do know, the observational people, but they're either not, nobody's paying any attention to them. They're just voices in the wilderness. Uh, but, they're um, actually defunding them. There's evidence that they're actively trying to shut them oh, down. Oh, well, yeah, this is the thing that uh, didn't um, Shakova get taken away from that university in Alaska or wherever she yeah. was? She, yeah. um, and of course, Wadhams hasn't been, he's conveniently disappeared from YouTube and all this kind of thing. Um, I, I wanted to go back a fair way in what you were talking to um, where we were talking about... By, by uh, the I, way, uh, I, I won't yeah. name names, but the, the Guys have been assassinated for for this. <laughs> yeah, I'm prepared yeah. to talk about it because um, you know the landscape has shifted and there's so much shit going on. You seem to be able to get away with it, but one of the reasons um, why yeah, I've been I, I, circumspect is because you know I I could be taken on. See, I think at this stage they trust that so much shit's going down. There's so many conspiracy theories that like no one will believe me. But if if yeah yeah if you ever got in that direction or something you you know basically yeah I can be taken out very easily I'm, I'm exceptionally easy to get rid of. <laughs> um, no, but this is this goes all the way back to the beginning of the the discussion and and the David Ike point thing where 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 uh, that that on the surface of it uh, if if you appear to be a nutter who's pushing a fringe you know, really um, peculiar sounding idea that you kind of could get passed over. Um, but I actually want to move on to something a, a little bit. That's that what I'm might trusting. Little... That's, that's what yeah, I'm well, trusting. Well, new direction well, with the extinction idea is, is basically we yeah, have well, cover, right? We have nuts. I've got, cover, right? I've got something. Is is to go nuts in another direct in a, in a slightly different direction as well. Um, we were talking about uh, seismic activity and the reporting of seismic activity. And um, uh, quite a long time ago, when I first fell down the rabbit hole, um, I was regularly listening to a YouTube channel. It was called Margot's Healing Corner, M-A-R-G-O, apostrophe S, Margot's Healing Corner. She appeared to be a religious nutter who was... Uh, who would just have these daily reports on seismic activity, volcanoes and earthquakes. 
all around the place. And she would just sit there for a couple of hours every day going over this in this monotone voice, boring you shitless for hours and hours. Uh, but she also seemed to be some kind of a, a, a uh, healer, perhaps some kind of faith healer, psychic healer. She was obviously I into, you know, what, what, what people call woo-woo stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, of also adding that dimension into what we're doing as a way of uh, sort of confounding people who, who – look, I think anyone – how could I put it to you differently? In that talk with Sophie, where you where you uh, uh, were talking about the phthalates affecting human, uh, uh, I, I think testosterone levels or re reproduction at any rate, and you made a comment that <clears throat> look, even if we annulled the effect of the effect of these chemicals, uh, that the 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 tendency to to demasculinisation was sort of embedded in the universal fabric and that it would pop up again in some other way. In other words, all that's occurring in the universe is, is at, at multiple levels. It's just because a thing is appearing at one level it, um, doesn't mean that it doesn't also exist simultaneously but it, it, from, from, you know, from the finest energetic expressions right down to the densest. Um, and I'm also looking at that in terms of people like, for instance, just the example of came to mind was this 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 woman, Miss Margot, you know, is uh, uh, perhaps uh, being in contact with somebody like that um, who uh, recognizes perhaps that we're at the precipice of something, is not quite sure what's happening, but has got their own particular take on it. Um, and, you know, we bring that in the discussion because I think what you're looking at now is you've got to basically be talking to people who who are capable of thinking at this multiple different levels and, and not looking for a very literal straight story here, who can, hand, who can listen to David Icke and instead of going, oh, what a fucking nutcase, go, hang on, this guy could be saying something. And actually being able to get beneath the surface a little bit, um, and so it, it sort of might be the survival strategy for the extinction arty is to be addressing it, what we're doing at that level, and that would also simultaneously kind of deal with your concerns about consistency and contradiction, because uh, I, I've sat very quietly and watched your contradictions and inconsistencies. Uh, over time, uh, and I find if I sit quietly for long enough, they resolve themselves, and I find that there, where I thought there was, there wasn't, uh, and where there still is, uh, it's perfectly. Um, don't know how to quite explain it, but it's acceptable. It's not doesn't just doesn't uh, it doesn't doesn't demolish your your words Can in I... any way. Yeah, can go I, on. I'll look, yeah. I can try go to on. characterize this. So what it what what's going on is pieces of a web are being illuminated non-linearly, and then the whole thing shines at the end. Yeah. yeah oh, but, sure. That's a good way. Yeah. Go on anyway. Oh. Yeah, but the, 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 so I think it's worthwhile putting everything down in one piece to just uh, certainly check through my thinking. Um, and, and make sure that it is all consistent. And, and I mean, in terms of of policies, if we, if we're going to be completely upfront about uh, the flippening and and try and popularize the idea, then I think um, we should be able to talk, point to one document and have our beliefs in in all areas laid down. So, what our policy is on geoengineering and policy on greenhouse gas emissions and everything. Um, but is that you know, even I, worth doing? What? Why make ourselves? Well, it, it's worth doing because, like you guys were saying at the beginning, the whole plague of cynicism that the the alien cortex, or I've called an evil spirit all my life, that the plague of cynicism prevents people from delving into those deeper layers and looking into it like that. So maybe just spelling it out and hoping maybe that you know they do start to overcome that cynical attitude and look deeper. 
Yeah, I mean, the the you see, it'll save time. Did we lost him again. Uh, you're cutting out, Hugh. Yeah, yeah, I see connection lost. Shoot. But yeah, like I, I think it'd be worthwhile to to make a manifesto spelling it out because it's like, um. Yeah, it's just either people can't do that right now where they can dig deeper into those layers or they refuse to because of a cynical attitude. I can't really, you know, characterize exactly what it is, but it's just like how I posted that. Um, you know how I posted that art piece a while back um, with the Ouroboros and stuff. Most people that other people that saw that just said cute, but it seemed on the extinctionati that people actually understood what that piece was saying. So it's like, you know, probably most people just can't or either can't do or refuse to, you know, look deeper. I don't know exactly. Yeah, well, the, I mean, I, yeah, what, what I was saying, just, just by one second. So, so what I was saying was that, that uh, as when you get into it, then it's amazingly, all things are kind of quite, okay, amazing number of things. So in other words, it's it's fine to be green and do, you know, uh, landfall panels and wind harms and stuff. It's like if that floats your boat, yourself out. But it's just as if accelerationist, and I think we should be, you want to accelerate the flipping. And then you say, well, then it's okay to burn greenhouse gases. It's it's okay. Exxon is suddenly okay. Exxon is fine. It's basically see, what you really want is is what's in essence is happening. You you want China and India to burn fossil fuels like there's no tomorrow, um, with the the global dimming and stuff, and then around about 2030, you want them all to go green and the, to lose the aerosol masking effect. At, at the moment, you lose the aerosol masking effect and grow green. You add 0.6 of a degree, but it'll be about one degree they add. So if India does what they've pledged to do and China does. Basically, they'll ramp up the greenhouse gases. That's great because it'll melt the, the Greenland ice sheet and accelerate the flipping. And then immediately they'll all go green. That'll add about a degree. And then we're pushing ourselves into almost certainty of precipitating an earthquake. And so that's good. So so knock yourself up. It, you know, so so green tech is great because you you know you 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 stop global dimming. The thing aren't great. I mean, burning fossil fuels. Go, go for it. Live profitably. Fly. Go and do what you want. It's all, it, it's all for the good. You're all accelerating the, the flipping. The, the, the system. You see, it's it's much like a, you know, having an alcoholic dad or something like that. You you just say you've got this dysfunctional family. There's an alcoholic dad, and you know if you. You know that where this all ends, you know that he's going to drink himself to death and nothing's going to stop him. Now, if you faulty and stuff, you go and, you know, sit at the sit in the driveway and, and you know, say, Dad, you better stop drinking or, you know, or, or say, like, we're going to we're going to take over the household and we're going to take over the reins and, you know, put dad down. And, the, you know, that's faulty. And then it's like, no, it's never going to happen. He's going to smash your face before you do that. And then if you XR, then you think, you know, then you're like a naggy wife or a daughter. And you're like, yeah, you, you leave all these passive aggressive little notes saying, Dad, we love you. Please stop drinking and stuff. And you say, like, no, we've got to be the one adult in the family that goes and says, like, look, let's be realistic. Dad's going to fucking drink himself to death. There's no way we're going to stop it. So given if that's the reality, it's better that he fucking drinks himself to death soon because he's wrecking our lives, causing so much misery and damage to everybody. If he's going to die anyway, better he die sooner and start shoving alcohol at him. So here, Dad, get was see if you Michael McGibbon, if you McGibbon or something like that, you you say like, well, we must get him off the hard stuff and get him on beer or low alcohol stuff and stuff. That's what transition is. It's like saying like, no, you know that he's not a he's not going to do it. He if you go and buy him beer or low alcohol stuff, he'll do that. He'll pour his whiskey in it. He's not going to stop the whiskey. He's he's going to do that and whatever your your low alcohol solution is. So you know, carbon tax, none of these things work. Yeah, but they're all good. 
if you if you want a carbon tax, that's great. The governments will tax. They will, you know, put on a carbon tax. That money will go into the treasury. They'll spend that money on the fossil fuel economy and gro and growth. So it's not good from the point of view of that's wrecking the ecology, but it's good from the point of view is the end is coming sooner. So so all of this stuff works. Geoengineering, it's coming too slow. It, it'll take years. It's David Keith has to go slowly and stuff, so they could never ramp it up. Uh, anyway, even if they did it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't stop the thing. Same with uh, marine cloud brightening. It's too late. So the, the, those things are not going to stop or Hugh, change. Hugh, what, 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 but what's the ultimate point then? Is is that really the only point in pushing this uh, uh, um, awareness of the flipping? And this actually got nothing to do with the trajectory of, of uh, civilization. Uh, it, aren't it we has. actually it has because we want people to survive. We want someone to, you see, there's a great risk. Yes, there's but I mean, that's risk. going to be fairly well a chance event anyway. Um, uh, yes, you know, if, if, yes, but there, there, there's some really dumb things that we're doing now that you should be against because you see what they're going to do is they're going to do things like nuclear. So you don't mm. want nuclear power stations. There are 410 nuclear power stations. Those are yeah. going to be a serious problem for anybody that makes it through the flipping. So they, you know, if whenever you hear the hydrogen economy, that's the politically correct. Uh, but that's locked in. It's locked in already, people. though. You know, I mean, it, it, it come. It doesn't matter which scenario plays out. Those 400 stations are going to be there. They're not going to be. Yeah, but they're going to have more. They're going. You see, every it takes about yeah. twelve years to commission one of these things, and they're going to be yeah. adding them. You see, so yeah. so you know, if you think in terms of like a war, the the Cold War starting, so like most people are thinking, oh, this is awful. No, it's great. You see, you you, you don't want a nuclear war because then it it makes a nuclear winter. A nuclear winter could dra dramatically alter the whole situation in a not good way at all. Yeah. You, you would be parked in a thing where you have a nuclear winter and no flipping is not a good good place to be. But what's really great is if is exactly what's happening. If we have proxy wars in the Ukraine and Iran and Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait, you know, the, the, that, the military is a huge fossil fuel machine. You want it to burn as much oil as possible, put up greenhouse gases. So, yeah, Cold War II proxy wars are great as long as they don't go nuclear. Um, it's yeah, it's accelerating the end time. So, but you know, the, we we want to, you know, it's kind of like pulling off a plaster. If it's it's you know, it's straight out of Shakespeare. It's it's out of Macbeth. If it were done when it were do done, then it were would be best. It were done quickly. Well, it is done when it's done. When there's a flipping, it's done, baby. <laughs> it's it's like getting an etch sketch, tipping it up, shaking it around, and starting a new picture. So. It, it's almost, you know, it, it's very, very tough times for, for the survivors to, to get through. But after that, uh, they're heading for a kind of an Eden. So we, we want to fast forward to that and get over the shitty point. Also, what I'm saying about them flipping the switch on the way out, the alien cortex doesn't make it through the flipping, by the way. So the, the, the thing that is very dangerous is uh, that they'll do a table flip and wipe us all out on you know on the exit that's real dangerous so you want the flipping to happen soon because it it you know if things get a bit too dark in terms of collapse collapse will happen anyway regardless of the flipping but if it's too bad uh, there'll be mass suicides and the, the, somebody might hit the red button so we really want to avoid that kind of outcome and the longer oh, this is the, the point drags on the more those scenarios yeah. come up. yeah because so, so it's just saying that the flipping is the big big solution that everybody's looking looking for wouldn't it be funny if we did some ai we ran a big ai all these transhumans that they'll tell us what the solution is and well i'll tell you ai has already told us what the solution is if you have a look at these ai things that can do the danny beckov effect which they're running by the way they're telling us, they're saying, you don't have a problem. Basically, this problem is solved by the flipping, and there on out, it's Eden for anybody that survived. So. 
knock yourself out. <laughs> Um, we, we haven't got time to do it now, but maybe in the next meeting, uh, can we visit the, the extension of this, which is what you just touched on, which is for the small number of people left, this may be a, some kind of an Eden for them. Uh, but most it's people... On what's uh, left? What's, what's left? Yeah. So, so, well, so depending, we're causing tremendous yeah. destruction to that Eden. I mean... That's the, right. You, so... They're going to be domestic I, I, cows wandering around feral and chickens wandering around feral. Yeah, but those are not yeah. going to last, right? You need real wild animals for them to. So you see what what got us through <clears throat> the previous one is there were a lot of the intact ecosystems with wild yeah. animals. Yeah. So you most to get through this, you really it's not heat you have to get through. It's cold. It's a it's a short snap of 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 very very cold weather. By the way, if all this is, comes, if you haven't heard or any of this before and it all comes as a bit of a shock, I've got worse for you, is that it's, it's very unlikely that there's only one flip. <laughs> so this isn't, isn't bad enough. There's probably one or two flips, maybe a series in before the Earth stabilizes again. So you don't have to just get through one flip. In very short order, maybe in a few years or maybe a hundred or so, uh, you know, on geology, some geological thing, you, you probably have to undergo one or two more. So they, they probably come in a little flutter and they dance. <laughs> the, Sorry, uh, to you, but but it's, it's survivable. Just remember that, that humans survived it. Um, I have a question. Um, so wasn't there like some paleolithic or neolithic humans like living in north america during the last flippening like because the native americans ancestors and stuff wasn't there people that crossed that land bridge land bridge in to the u.s maybe on like the west coast or something yeah you see the timeline gets funny because the first people there are the salutrians and the Salutrians probably came from France, though it's very politically correct to, to say that because you're supposed to say First Nation and stuff. Well, sorry, guys. Sorry for political correctness, but almost definitely uh, Native Americans are not the First Nation. The First Nation are the Salutrians, and they almost definitely come from France. Which is terribly sorry, but white people are first. <laughs> like, uh, that's hilarious. You can actually say it. I'm sorry, all the evidence is staring the, the guys in the face and they, they're having a big argument about Salutrian first. And what's hidden is, that's racist. <laughs> sorry, dude. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, sure exactly. Work. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't settled on who was first exactly. I'm just wondering, like, if people got here and whoever they were, like, were they because it was like 20,000 years or something. So, like, there had to have been people in this in this landmass that survived the flippening. Yeah, but but here this is an important point. Is is I think you know we must talk again about what what kind of skills you need. And I think the people that survive are kind of ice guys, so they're kind of ice men. So I think that the Neanderthals survived previous flippings because they are kind of ice men. But you know, kind of like you you have to be kind of like an Inuit, um, and you because see if you look at these pastoralists like Vikings that, that went to Greenland and Iceland and didn't make out, they all died horribly. Um, they could have survived if they just adop adopted the native ways, but because they stuck to pastoralism and stuff, they, they, they couldn't adapt. They didn't think like an Inuit. And so they, they were, so now most people are, are that way, permaculturists, all of that. They're thinking like a, a Viking pastoralist. They're not going to survive. You have to think more in terms of hunting animals and, um, you know, that you got to know how to butcher a kill. Yeah. I mean, I've done a little bit of that with, with roadkill deers because I had to feed those wolves I was um, working with. So I, I did a little bit of that. That's a really a spiritual experience there. <laughs> yeah. But you, yeah. you, you have to you see, I, I don't think you have much hope of living off plants. Uh, herbivores can do it much better than us. But we're better off hunting herbivores. We're, yeah, we're predators. You need the um the iron and potassium and stuff in the meat. Yeah, you know, the meat is super nutritious. Like I've never agreed with the 
vegetarians it's like dude your brain is 60 percent fat <laughs> you're a predator you get that big brain from eating meat so you know don't feed me this you bullshit need the so we'll we'll chalk up that's another thing to put in the manifesto is what's our, our take on vegetarianism yeah and yeah i read this. this but I, I i mean i think that that's the thing is you're not going to survive the flipping in as a vegetarian if you want to be a vegetarian for the next few decades before the flipping go for it knock yourself out be as stir as you like eat whatever you like you can eat cows it doesn't matter a damn just make yeah, sure that they're not the wild animals but yeah, you know, it's if you like, think you're going to do permaculture and survive the flipping, think again. Yeah, it's like, you know, a lot of my favorite stories center on predatory animals. And like one of them, the fox, and his favorite thing is chopping coney. That's what he calls it when he hunts rabbits. He calls it chopping coney. <laughs> no, chopping rabbits and little furry warm-blooded animals, that's what you need to do, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah rabbits. Make sure that you're in a place with a lot of rabbits. Yep, chop the coney. <laughs> well, yeah. so, okay, well, let's end it off there and then we'll try and uh, take it up again in the, the Western meeting tonight. Uh, um, Hugh, uh, is it possible? I guess. No, no, I, I, to avoid it being repetitious, can you go more into the other side of what we're doing? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's what you want to do, but I mean, you know, some people are going to survive this and, and still be on the planet somewhere. Uh, but for most of the people on the planet, they're going to die. Uh, and most of those people are going to die pretty unfortunate deaths. And I think it uh, be reasonable to say that most of those people are going to know that they haven't got any particular escape or much that they can do about it. Um, and this is a point I wanted to zero in on fairly closely um, because uh, I'm sure there's more than, than one other person or, on just in the, the extinction arty who realises that they haven't got much option when things start to go uh, down, that, you know, they're more or less going to be where they are now and they're probably going to starve to death. And we've, you've already mentioned about that being an extremely unfortunate way to go and this kind of thing. Um, so what I'd like to do is, if you can, talk about that kind of thing and the role of the extinction arty as a bit of a hospice and um, the discussion of the flippening as as being a way to focus people's minds more closely on, on their death. Um, and just to touch on what you said about consistency and contradiction, because, um, you, you know, for instance, you make the point about, um, sorry, I didn't realise I had the camera off. Uh, you made the point about uh, uh, rule number eight is the rule that gets referred to more, more almost exclusively in none of the others. Um, and uh, I think, you, you know, can you, can you possibly go into uh, a contradiction there or an apparent contradiction, which is, you know, for a person who is starving to death, uh, you know, uh, it might be better if they took a bit of a shortcut. Um, uh, yeah, and... so there's a contradiction in the desiderata. It's kind of necessary. Um, so you don't want to do any self-harm. The, the major reason is because your alien cortex will rather than... Take the, you know, yeah. yeah, it'll take the easy way out, which is yeah, killing you right. off rather than actually achieving liberation. But, yeah. in, but you see, in terms of other desiderata, like not being too dogmatic, that runs yeah. also in the process that you shouldn't obey any rules. So mm. it's one of the desiderata is not to obey any rules. Mm. So that is a definite mm. in rule and injunction so that it contradicts mm. it. So you don't want to be too too absolutist about these things. And no yeah. one no one wants to die of starvation. In fact, no one really dies of starvation. What you die of is you die of disease because your your body is fending off diseases all the time all the diseases inside you everybody thinks diseases outside and pandemics come from nah. and you, it's already you, there 
yeah. you look inside what's inside your gut bacteria and your mouth bacteria. There's like the worst pandemics you've ever seen. They're right inside us all the time. Yeah. The reason is yeah. they don't wipe us out is we're healthy and we're defending ourselves all the time from them. Well, not defending ourselves. It's just that we have uh, a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And that's that's what we are. That's what life is. And so that that loop stays closed, so they don't get a, get in. What happens when when you you get malnourished is that self reinforcing feedback loop breaks. As soon as it breaks, all the other competing self reinforcing feedback loops, which is you know, the essentially parasites and, and disease, they they all take over and then kind of clean up, vacuum up what, what's left of you. So, so people die of disease, um, and so you, you, you think, well, there's no when you know that the, the, there's no hope, right, and you know that this you 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 know you're breaking up worse worse than the jet stream. Uh, yeah, it's like there's no point in suffering needlessly through it all. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, you know, I don't mean for you to go into that now, but I, I mean, perhaps at the, at the following meeting, you can deal with this other side of the whole discussion. This, this more personal, bring it down you, to the personal level. You know, but, um, but in in general, you want to be you you want to you want to be anti, um, unaliving yourself. You can't really say that, mm, YouTube, but you you yeah, want to be anti that yeah. because. People are going to do it in droves. They're already doing it in droves. So there's yeah. going to be a lot of self-destructive behavior indirectly through abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, all sorts of physical mutilations and fetishes and stuff like that. It's going to be pandemic. It already is. And so uh, that that goes against the grain of, of making sure that at least some of us survive. You see, you... To get through to enlightenment, you have to go hit rock bottom in terms of depression. Now, you can't make it through to the other side if you give in to the depression. So you want to be really, really anti people taking that route out. But, I mean, when it's all said and done, you, when, you, when you're really on the way out, you get an absolution. The, sec the second prize in the race is that you know, you get uh, deathbeds, last rites, as you get forgiven everything. Um, I think this is probably what you're encountering is, is probably, I think, what a lot of gurus, for want of a better word, encounter is the, the level at which to pitch their talk because of the possibility of people mis mistaking what they're saying um and, and i don't know whether um you know maybe it, it it could be time for you to just pitch yourself at a certain level and if a certain segment of people mistake it well just too fucking bad for them kind of thing rather than um uh sort of trying to trying to address too many levels of understanding at the same time um I know there, because there are consequences. the consequences for us taking taking that route you see uh if you give all the opposition um that kind of leeway that, that you are being callous or encouraging people to to take that route uh the reaction that could be vicious you see it's a it's a great diversion from from our main task is 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 if you can if they can accuse us of that that's kind of the end of us there's massive repercussions from that so you can't be callous about that you have to be super careful um about not being too cavalier on that score yeah the, you see the in general, that's the deflection problem. There's another one, and that's that that the, the, you don't want people people talk and do things out of false knowledge. So on the on the path to enlightenment, they they will hear something which is they don't really understand, but it is what they're saying is true, but they are saying so. It's it's what's it called in um, epistemology? It's 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 an 
a, a, a fact that is actually in point of fact true, but the reasons they think it is true is wrong. So, so in other words, th those are very dangerous because the, the people pick up on a truth. See, one, one of them is, oh, you can just sit back and watch the world end. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. And the other one, but you, you don't want, you know, that is the truth, but you don't want to know that because you don't know what you're saying. And the other one is, well, everything's okay in the end. And it's like, yes, that is the truth. But since you still think in terms of dualism and black and white and stuff, then in your language, that's a falsehood. And yeah, so but sure. just see, you're perfectly right. right but the point is, is right, but it's what you're saying for the wrong reasons and with the wrong understanding. So you should be corrected but, because you live in the world of correction. Okay, but I mean, you know, when it comes down to that, unfortunately, it, it only leaves people like yourself as really being uh um deserving of, of being allowed to open your mouth because you know the the, the level of, from which you're operating is is uh oh, no, understands no, it's, that it's, no no i don't have a license at the moment everybody that's talking no i don't them. mean some license but the no, point no, is no, you no, do no no the, everybody that once you open your mouth and speak you're speaking from the alien cortex it's a lie so i'm I'm lying to you now. Whenever I'm speaking, yes. I'm lying to you. There's, there's you, no other option. If you use no, words... That, that, that's right, but the option is less wrong from a person who at least has got over their alien cortex. You know, I mean, you don't have any choice but to use words. You already yes, compromise you, the minute you make a sound, you know. Yes, um, but, but a lot of, lot of guys like that silent guru and a lot of guys have just used a silent transmission for that very reason is that, you, you know... But uh, no one understands that now. So you, you know, as the world descends into more and more ignorance, then then uh, you have to meet people for where they are. So if you do the silent guru thing, everybody says, "Oh, look at this! It's such a joke! It's just a gimmick and stuff." And it's like, you know, subtlety is lost in this day and age. So you have to start talking and engaging people at their level. As soon as you do that, you then they accuse you of inconsistency, hypocrisy, and so it's like, yeah, it's, that comes with language. It's impossible to, but, by Gödel's theorem, to even be completely consistent, completely wholly true, all the stuff we're supposed to be. All, all, all that stuff, you can't do it at once. But, uh, I mean, are you, uh, is it better looking at it this way, perhaps, that that I don't think this, this little thing called the extinction idea is ever going to become, you know, a, a very big phenomena you know it, it, it's it um and so um i think uh, it could become about as big as like the flat earth thing you see you see i think that the our goal should be to try and uh make it a meme that that everybody knows about but dismisses i think is kind of a good goal kind of like the flat earthers so everybody knows it they kind of entertain it it's a thing out there, and it's at the back of people's minds because. Well, that's a bit like David well, Icke as well, I suppose. A bit like David Icke. You see, you see. Yeah. My my thing is this. I, I maybe it's just personal, but I have this vision of people when all the stuff goes down, then people are going to be terribly confused. You know, in other words, if they know, if they go, oh my god, those are extinction hardy nuts were right. And it's like, yeah, so that's a good enough gift to give them, right? Yeah. No, so okay, they don't have to point. believe that's, it, that's accept it or anything. They, but they need no, to know no. about it so that when it happens, they need to know what they're looking at. Yeah, but they're, they're, I guess this is what I meant right at the beginning, was that the way to stay out of trouble with it is to present it like that deliberately so that you don't get into overt conflict with the forces of... of the status quo, but there's still a message there. Like, you know, David Icke is dismissed as a complete whack job. Uh, but, you know, for instance, um, I did, I felt I didn't have any trouble seeing something there in, in what was going on. You know, I, I, I thought, okay, something's going on. This guy's actually quite interesting. But I don't have to take him literally. Uh, I just sort of use him as an extra can opener to, to broaden my understanding and you know uh well, you can that, well, that could be the way we operate 
Well, 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 let's go over the manifesto first, make sure we all agree um, politically on, and then decide what to do. But I think, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think you could, I mean, it, it's, a, I think we have to go full on against the mindless opposition. Hey, I find it terribly difficult. It wears me down. I think it wears anybody down going up against the wall of idiocy. But I think we, we have to do it as a vehicle to so that people can hear about so, the flipping. Um, so, yeah, I think we, we have to go headlong. Yeah, but again, it. you don't... Yeah, yeah but you're going... You don't meet it head yeah. on on its own. You know, I... I uh, you know, a rational argument, it's not going to, it doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Um, you know, so it might be better just displaying something quite, it makes the point, but doesn't take them on I, at I, the again, level. I can I always come back to the art because, because the way, mm. you see, I was thinking we were in the Western meeting, we must talk about the cartoons and stuff, but that's where I was taking the cartoons. If, if you start off like that, I think we can get, get them into being they start off light and frivolous and kind of idiotic um but you know they, they get more and more interesting i think you can take the elam stark character uh, you know because he's a cult leader so you, you can actually use it as a vehicle for a lot of deeper things so it kind of suckers people in with a bit of candy and then you know, it's all kind of sugar-coated and you can get deeper and deeper as you get into it. So I think we can do stuff like that. Um, yeah, but but first let's make sure we have all our ducks in a row. And 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 then, yeah, I think some people might bail. Some things I think people might be a bit too, too much for them. The, the, already our small group might split on, on trying to agree on certain issues. I got to admit that right back at the beginning, uh, when you started to formulate the, the rules, um, the whole idea just left me cold. I, I, I just, in, you know, I, I just didn't see a, a um, um, you know, it, it, all of these things depend on the level at which you look at it. And, and, and then when you go into individual rules or statements when they're made, it's multiple different ways of interpreting them and taking them. Um, and so it's very difficult to say that you you depart from, from them or that you don't agree or that you've got some argument because it's some other level that's, that doesn't exist. Um, you know, as soon as you start doing something like that, um, you know, I think for the people who would leave on account of perhaps a manifesto that you might do, I think they'd need to ask themselves whether they've got a sufficiently um, varied way of looking at things. Um, well, well, I think anybody that comes up with a strong point of view will encounter it again, again on different levels, and and you know it'll kind of recur. So we ought to address it, make sure we 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 get our position straight on it because we got we if anybody comes up with a challenge it's not going to be unique we're going to be a challenge later on a wider scale if we if we move forward and popularize it so it's better to address it now but okay well we're, we're going to suggest that we better round it off at, at that point and then pick it up again at the next meeting okay um, because it's getting led from for Mike and stuff. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. This is fascinating stuff. So no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it it will get more fascinating. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but all right, let's just pause and then and then and then stop. And then uh, yeah, we must go over the sigil and stuff. Uh, I got I got a few ideas for what to do with the sigil and stuff. So let's go over that in a few hours. All right then. Just for still.
Oh, problem I've not even come up. Okay. All right, then. All right. Okay, All right. thanks. You. Thank you. And, yeah, thanks, I, everybody. I hope, thanks, everybody. I hope the, yeah. the, uh, the sun doesn't um, rise in the... <laughs> Rise in the West uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it does. <laughs> See you later, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Be safe.